welcome to Shalom Hartford. I'm Pat Kazakoff, and today we'll be speaking to Renit Shoham, a community activist par excellence. Whatever that's good that happens in West Hartford has something to do with Renit. I'm Pat Kazakoff. You're watching Shalom Hartford. Stay with me, and we're going to meet this community activist. So you're a community activist. I guess. I, I never guess. look at myself in that way. I, um, but I guess. So you came from Israel. How did you end up here? After finishing high school, I served the army, um, as all Israelis have to do. Most Israeli, after they finish the army, they venture to the big world before entering the college slash university. Um, I had an opportunity to come to America. My husband now, back then just a family friend, was able to provide us with some housing. So my mom and um, I came for a trip, and the rest is history. So you say that he was a family friend. How did he end up being a family friend? Because he's an American and you're Israeli. So going back six years, I was 14. He was in second year college, and he came to Israel with a group of Jewish American kids on an organized trip. He stayed in the kibbutz that we lived in, and it was common to adopt the volunteers to show them what a home in the kibbutz looks like. And also, four o'clock in the kibbutz is very much a family time. So once you're done with work and your siesta, you go to your family. Through another girl who was on the trip, who worked with my mom on the kibbutz. She found out that Scott... That's the husband. That's my husband now, <laughs> mm -hmm. of 31 years. Mm -hmm. uh, needed a family because, as I say back then, or maybe now too, he's a little bit of a Jewish, spoiled American boy. A prince. <laughs> we call that a, 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 a Jewish prince. There was no ice cubes in the kibbutz, and you can't drink water without ice cube. And he wanted his Coca-Cola cold, and he didn't particularly care for the food in the dining room because that's where the food is served in the kibbutz. So my mother, being a typical Jewish mother, took, her, took him under her wing and gave him a key to our little apartment and he was able to get ice cube from the freezer and put his bottle of Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. um, and she, my mother is a very good cook and she loves to cook and she loves to feed. Um, and so she cooked meals for him and he said that he will never forget her. You were 14 years old. How old was he? 20. So we call that robbing the cradle a little <laughs> bit. So he comes to America. You come to America. Excuse me. You come to America with your mother. Right. Was that a coincidence or you think your mother was planning this a little bit? So it is sad that my mom <laughs> <laughs> was behind the scene. <laughs> right. So, so you know, here, she claims so that she just came. She wanted me to come. The opportunity came, she was supposed to come with her husband and it didn't materialize, so she offered me to come Got it. with and, her. And, and, and the rest is history, as the you The rest said. is history. So you're brought up on a kibbutz. For not all my life, but the later part of my life, yeah. When you say later, at age 14, you were still on the kibbutz. Right, I was, I moved, we moved to the kibbutz. We lived in the city until I was 12, and we moved to the kibbutz when I was 12. And what is the name of the city, and what's the name of the kibbutz? So I was born in Petah Tikva. I grew up in Givatayim, which is a suburb of Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And the kibbutz is in the northern part of Israel, between Haifa and Akko, and uh, the name is Afek. Afek. So uh, we're talking about, you know, I introduced you as a community activist because that's what all the literature says about you. And you spent a lot of time in the kibbutz. Do you think that had something to do with your community activism? Do you think that you had something in your head that came from the kibbutz? I never thought about it, but you bring the question to me. When you live in a kibbutz, you have moral, I don't want to say physical, but you have obligation to your, the people around you. And it's a small community. You know, you work together, you do for others, others do for you, but you have responsibility from an early age. You know, it starts maybe one day a week that you work somewhere, wherever it is, at the dining room, at the cow shed, at the chicken coop. So you have to do so, something for other people outside of your uh, nuclear family. Yes. Uh, 
so you contrast that with American life? Very different. Very different. Very different. So I guess when you say that, um, I guess from very early on, I felt that you have obligation to your community. Did you feel and that? Did you, did you articulate that? Or now that we're talking about it? Now that we're talking about it. That you I can see. See it, right. Um, I've always told my kids that it's important to give back to the community that you live in. But I never traced it back to my days in the kibbutz. But it could have been. <laughs> yes. It could have been. Definitely. It could have been. Definitely. It, it's probably kind of hidden, sort of hidden Well, we just message. brought it out. Yes, we just brought exactly. It out. It's a hidden message that was in, in me that maybe later on kind of came, came out. out. So then we moved to America and we marry this, the husband, Scott, with the Coca-Cola and the ice cubes. We, <laughs> yes. And now he has a lot of Coca-Cola, a lot of ice cubes. Doesn't seem to be a problem. No. No. It's particularly ice cubes. We gave the Coca-Cola away, but the ice <laughs> the cubes, ice cubes we still have plenty. And so then what happens? So now, how do you set up your life here? What do you What do? You, do? you get married, and what do you do? So once I decided to stay here, beginning just for a year or so, um, I went into college. So I started in a community college in Enfield, then transferred to Central because I wanted to become a teacher, which I did. And I graduated with my four-year degree, pregnant with my first daughter, Maya, from Central. Then fast forward, I did my student teaching at Solomon Schechter because my supervisor had this sight to see that it can potentially be good for me in the future. Because usually public schools do not want you to do your student teaching in a private institution. But she was very accommodating and she could see that there was a potential job opportunity for me in the future, which it did. After I had my first daughter, I went to Schechter to work at Schechter at the nursery school then working on my second degree while I was pregnant with my second daughter. So when did we start with the community activism? So I'm going to call it community activism. Okay. It, seems you're, you, it appears to me that you're not so comfortable with that title. How, what title would you find more comforting than community Just activism? Just Ronit. It's Ronit. a good title. Okay. <laughs> so Ronit, when did we start this phase so, of giving back to the community? I think, and that's what I was about to get to, is once Maya went into Schechter, my oldest daughter, slowly, because as a mom, and then of one, two, and then three children, I had a limited time of what I can do, but that's when it started. So how, what was the first so, thing that started? joining the PTO at Schechter. Do you know that First Selectman Lisa Hevner, Sherry Cantor, the mayor of West Hartford, our Lieutenant Governor General, Nancy Wyman, also started like that? So you're, you're on I'm, the I'm track. I'm in track. Yeah, you're, you're on track. <laughs> Among Good company. You're, you're in good company. You have your child, you want to give back to the school, the community that your child is involved. That's the first close things that you can give to. But are you conscious at the time of giving or are you conscious at the time of activity, that you're looking for activity? And this is the one that has the smallest barrier to entry. So I think at the time what I felt is that I wanted there wasn't like big things that I want to change, but there's some things. And if I wanted to cha change something, there is a famous quote that says, you have to be the change. So I would say that right from the start, I felt that if I wanted to change, I need to make it happen. The thing that I know about you is that you changed the baseball, that you changed the way baseball was played in West Hartford. Talk a little bit about that. So when my girls, who very much enjoy sports, and I think it's important for kids to engage in sport, not necessarily just for the competitive edge to it, but there is a, there's a big value. There's, mm -hmm. there's a larger value than just competing, which is also a value. I felt that the current baseball league in town did not provide opportunity, equal opportunity, for everybody to play baseball. And did you think that everybody should play baseball? Everybody that wants to. That yes. was your, in your head. Yes. I, so I, you must have had a lot of conflict with that because people who are highly competitive players, am I, am I, am I hitting something? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Because people feel that competition and fairness cannot coexist. 
and I felt that it can coexist. Looking at the history of West Hartford, how many professional baseball players did we produce? Not that many. I think there's one, sort of my recollection, but to me, the goal of youth sports or sports in general is to create good habits, to be part of a team, the camaraderie. So to... how did you change it? Because the competitive model is is standardized is, is standardized operating procedure. How did you change from the competitive model to what did you call it? West Hartford Little League. West Hartford Little League. We created another league and we created a mission where the big part of the mission is that every child in West Hartford, regardless of ability, sex, background, um, that wishes to play baseball, will be able to engage in the game of baseball in a meaningful way. And the meaningful way was also important because no child in West Hartford Little League, no player, is stuck in left field forever. And we continuously revise those to make it fair and competitive. And w were boys and girls on the same team? Absolutely. And then who could you play against? Like who? It's all internal league. All internal it's, league. It's internal. And did you play against the more competitive uh, In teams? the summer. That's a whole different season. So during the season, all leagues in all time play within themselves. Then there is post-season, and that's when you play against other team and other um, towns and other community. Um, the important thing about one of, there's many important things I feel about West Hartford Little League is that um, we don't have tryouts. Um, because tryout, you either make it or not. Well, tryouts are competitive. Right, and you either make them, the team or do not make the team. In West Hartford Little League, we have group practice where the goal is to rate all the kids and create its goal by scoring. So like, if every team has to have a score of 25, it's equal, so each kid, kids get a number based on their ability, and the teams are equally distributed as equally as we can possibly humanly do it. So nowadays, is your league still in business? Very much. Very much. Very much. Now what about the competitive league? Is that still in business? It's still in town. So they're both they're Co both coexisting. Yes. Okay. Well you got it done. And it's exactly and the every child in West Hartford and the numbers multiply probably twice from the time that before we started to today of kids playing baseball in West Hartford. Let's talk about another challenge that you did. Because that, that is revolutionary. I mean, it's it's Little League, but you changed the paradigm of baseball in West, West Hartford. Hartford. Yes. Let's talk about another challenge. You started uh, the underground for teenagers. What was that all about? So it started as the grounds. Now it's the underground. When I was growing in Israel, teenagers have a lot to do. Places for them to spend time together, clubs, you know, <coughs> activities. And I felt that kids here, and through my involvement with Community of Concern at Hall, when my kids got to Hall, you know, the constant complaint of kids in West Hartford, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, and, and why there is the engaging in not so good behavior. We know what that behavior is. <laughs> is that there's nothing to do in West Hartford. So we created a place that, again, the mission of it is for kids to create the atmosphere, the activity, because we felt that if they create the activity, their peers will come. If I create it, my peers will come. So, so where was this? Where did so you do this? So it started at the old Barnes and Nobles. The town was very kind. The developer was very kind to give us the space for basically for free until such a day that they needed it. And it was great. It How was wonderful. How long did they give it to you for? About? I want to say it was about five or six years. It was five or six years. Yes. Yeah, it was so a long time. So you were in there for five or six years. Yes. There was no business in there. Right. Just you. Maybe five. Yeah, just us. Yeah, and just what's us. happening with it now? So then when they needed it for Maximus Wine, or the wine place, they were kind enough to find us another place, which was, is the old Tuesday morning across from the post office. 
Bishop's Corner. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we changed it to the underground because it's underground. under the ground. And we felt that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's like the basement. Kids now, love to be in the basement. Is it still going on? It's still going on. Uh, not going as strong. We're trying to revive it. We are really trying to get teenagers involved. And teenagers are very busy. So let me ask you a more pointed question. When we first started talking about this, you had said that the teenagers in West Hartford don't have anything to do. And we sort of were joking around what they are doing, which is not good behavior. Do you have any statistics or anything that says that given what you created, that dynamic changed? I do not. And I think that I would say that some years when we had a strong group of teenagers, I would say the statistic was more in favor of the ground slash the underground. But right now, it's a little limping. <laughs> It's, so, limp it's limping. It's well, limping. It takes yeah. a huge amount of, yes. of labor to get that. But it's a great, great space, and everybody that walks into the space, from kids, you know, teenagers to adults, love it. And what do they do there? So it's set like a coffee place. That's where the name Grounds came uh -huh. from, and then Underground. We have, you know, TV, TVs with their games, ping pong tables, hockey So it's tables. a real hangout. It's a real hangout. And we have a stage and all the equipment. Mo music. It's, a, it's mostly around music. My, uh, open mic, improv nights, uh, battle of the bands. You know, we have, we have a really strong culture in West Hartford for music, improv, the a cappella groups, so. And uh, that is all provided, like all that equipment, the music equipment, that is from private donations? We have or raised from the money. Town? We have raised money. We've had fundraisers, and that's where we, we have it. So from private donations or from the town? Private donations. Private donations. Let's switch a little bit because your, your, your community activism hits all different uh, groups of people. Let's talk about cut out cancer. That has been one of your latest initiatives. How did that start? Three years ago, a very close girlfriend was diagnosed with cancer. You feel very helpless. You wish you can take it away. What to do? Decided that what we can do is take her to her chemo session. She had 12. And really, it created a camaraderie among her old friends, new friends, high school friends. Fast forward, she was approaching the end of her chemo. We wanted to celebrate. We came across this documentary called Mondays at Racine. We thought, okay, I'll get it and we'll screen it in my living room and we'll just celebrate. But then it took a life of its own. And I say that cutout cancer um, is what Jonathan's dream, what Jonathan's dream is to Amy is cutout cancer to Rachel, my girlfriend Rachel. And why cut out? Because, um, so the premises of cutout cancer is we, Milano in, West, in uh, Bloomfield, donate their space the second Monday of every month, space and materials and everything. They've been amazing. And we open the salon when normally they're closed uh, to people undergoing cancer treatment and provide services like hair, cutting hair. Mm -hmm. Cut uh, out cancer. cancer. Mm -hmm. So cutting with hair goes along right, and no. we want to cut cancer away from society and from everybody. We provide um, hair, facial, manicure, pedicure, uh, massages. And who is doing those services? Uh, is Milano, the Milano hairdressers and manicures are doing that? So some, but now it's because it's, it's every, Monday, every month and we've been doing it for now two and a half years. We have expanded um, to many people who are volunteering their services from the community. And so women or, and some men come and uh, breakfast. Is, the community has really embraced this organization tremendously in every shape or form. We have breakfast donated, lunch donated. How many people flow through it? I would say about? between 30 to 40 in four hours. A lot. Yeah, lots of support, art therapy. We have a photographer that documents their cancer journey. We have an author who wrote a book about, a book about laughing in the face, the face of cancer, and she autographed the book and gave it to the ladies. And what we hear, some of them come in very sad and down, which you can understand why, and they live with a big smile. 
It must make um, you feel great. It's, it's, I say that the second Monday of the month is my favorite place to be. The, the fav my favorite place to be is at Milano because it's very uplifting. You yeah, think I can that you see be, while, you're, while yeah. you're talking, you're, you're beaming. It's, so it's a wonderful place. I'm going to change the conversation a little bit. You know, the name of, my, of this program is called Shalom Hartford. And my question is, where does the Judaism fit into all this? Um, while we've been talking, the, Judy, the, the word Judaism hasn't come in. There's been nothing about being Jewish or, I mean, we mentioned kibbutz, but that was about it. How does the Judaism figure into this? Do you think you're motivated by that? Or, or is it you're just right. humanistic? I mean, I think growing up being Jewish, mitzvot and doing and tikkun olam is something that you grow up with. Um, again, did I ever think about it? Like you asked me about growing up in the kibbutz. I think it's just part of my, who I am. But has the religion played a part? Have you, like, do you have a consciousness that you're doing, in quotation marks, God's work? Because that, that is what you're doing. Um, I wouldn't say so. I, I just feel that this is, and I guess part of who I am, I'm Jewish. And part of being Jewish is, I think, doing for others and doing for your community and for the world. And therefore, I feel that this is, it's something that I want to, I enjoy, I think it's important. Um, I think it gives the community, but definitely, definitely gives me a lot. A lot, yeah. So what's the latest project? What are we doing now? What are we going towards? Because, you know, all those three projects, there's, they're, they're still going on. Right, they're, and they're, then there is the Miracle League, which, W would lead me to the next project. So the Miracle League is stamped from West Suffolk Little League with, from our mission to serve every child, every ability. We realized that we really didn't provide for kids with disabilities. So, so Amy Barzak, who is the founder of Jonathan's Dream, she started Jonathan's Dream, which is a right. playground for right. children with disabilities. How do you figure into that? So she, when, jo so Jonathan's Dream was built 20 years ago and it was built from wood. Fast forward, wood doesn't last forever. It's a very heavily played on playground and the playground has to come down. It doesn't pass inspection. Amy has her story of why she called me. <laughs> uh, she called me and asked me, would I help her um, rebuild Jonathan's dream? And it's hard for me to say no. And you said yes. And I said yes. And I'm very happy that I said yes. It started four years ago. The great news is that we would break, be breaking ground in the spring of 2017. It's been a long up and down journey, a good one, that I've learned a lot from. It's an expensive playground. The economic times are not the greatest. There is greater needs in the community, but we managed and with the support of many, many people, including the town um, and the state, um, that we will, we will be breaking ground and build this incredible playground. So what now is the future for Ronit Shoham? What's the future? What are we looking at? The future is, and the goal, and I know that my kids and my family and my friends will be laughing to hear that, is only to maintain what I have and not to add any more. That's your goal? That's the goal. Well, you've got four projects on the, on the horizon. Plus others as well. That we haven't mentioned? Right. That we haven't <laughs> mentioned. And so having, having done all this, what do you want to tell, what do you want to say to the people out there? What do you want to say? Do you have a personal message? I guess it's probably a message that has been heard before is that if you want to change, be the change. That's number one. And number two, that to me, giving is really more about getting because I know that I give and I do, but what I get from it is far greater than what I give. You've been listening to Lanit Shoham. If you want to be the change, you've got to be the change. And that's all about Ranit Shoham. I'm Pat Kazaka. You've been watching Shalom Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.